Good morning and welcome to this webinar on climate change and mental health, part of the Wins Live series delivered as part of the Walk In My Shoes campaign at St. Patrick's Mental Health Services. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. This event will be available to view on demand afterwards. You'll be able to find the link at walkinmyshoes.ie and we'd love to hear from you throughout this morning's event. So if you've questions for our guests, comments you'd like to share, please get involved in the conversation as we'd love to hear your thoughts. Now, one thing just to say at the outset is that climate change is obviously incredibly serious and understandably many of us can feel a bit overwhelmed or helpless in the face of a crisis like this. So I just want to reassure you that what we're hoping to do this morning is understand a bit more about how we perceive a problem like this, how that impacts us and crucially how we can sort of harness a bit of hope and feel empowered to do something about it. Now, let me introduce you to our guest. So we're joined this morning by Carolyn Hickman, who is a psychotherapist, lecturer at the ba University of Bath, researching climate, anxiety in children and young people globally, and a board member of the Climate Psychology Alliance. We're also joined by Ty McIntyre, who's Assistant Professor of Environmental Psychology at Maynooth University, and Anthony Freeman, beekeeper at the Inner City Beekeeping Project, an initiative of the Robert Emmett Community Development Project here in Dublin 8, one of our neighbours at St. Patrick's. So good morning to you all. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us and share your expertise. We're really delighted to have you. Uh, I'm conscious that time is ticking and really everybody's here to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to wrap it up and just say, let's get started. Caroline, you're going to kick us off telling us a bit about eco-anxiety and sharing some really interesting findings from your recent research. Thank you so much and thank you for inviting me. I'm so pleased to be joining you today. So I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully you can see that's all okay now let me put it on the right view so hopefully that's okay and you'll tell me if it's not okay so but again thank you for inviting me here i'm really pleased to be here i'm going to start by giving a very quick introduction to climate psychology generally and some of the qualitative research that we've been doing for many years, and also through my practice as a psychotherapist. And I'm, then I'm going to go on to talk about the recent results of the quantitative research that we've done with 10,000 children and young people globally. As always, I've got enough to say that would probably last about an hour. So bear with me, I'm gonna try and give you the highlights of this and go fairly quickly, but you can get a copy of these slides later. So I would want to frame climate psychology and thinking about this emotionally and mentally and what this means by thinking, well, yes, this is catastrophic. Yes, this is worrying. Yes, this causes us anxiety, but there are also transformational possibilities here for humanity. So it's not all doom and gloom, but I do not want us to split into either it's good news or it's bad news. It usually contains both when we're talking about the psychological approach to this. So I want to frame this as a journey from an eco-anxiety to an eco-aliveness and eco-compassion and eco-empathy, that there is some wonderful possibilities here within the reality of what we're facing. I'm part of this group called the Climate Psychology Alliance and our strapline is facing difficult truths. And that's the underpinning message that I'm bringing here this morning, which is we really have to face the difficult truths emotionally, cognitively, and practically in order to face the climate biodiversity crisis. There's, it's an open access website. There's tons of resources there that people can go and have a look at and lots of podcasts, which can be helpful. I'm always used, really thankful to Gus Beth, who was the US advisor on climate change who said he used to think top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse and climate change. And with 30 years science, we could address those. But he said I was wrong. Our top environmental problems are selfishness, greed and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and a cultural transformation. So what he's really usefully doing is bringing the importance of psychology, of relationship, of feeling, of family life into the climate psychology field and into the climate crisis field. And just to kind of put this at scale, and I honestly don't mean to offend anybody because COVID is no fun and it's not something to be made light of. And I can assure you of that because I'm still dealing with long COVID. 
But this gives us some scale of understanding that we have COVID recession, we have multiple threats, multiple things to struggle with. Just keep in mind, I promised you, I was not gonna leave you feeling terrible at the end of this short talk. But it gives us some scale of thinking about the speed of response that we've seen, relatively speaking, to COVID and the looming threats of climate change and biodiversity collapse, which can help us understand why children and young people in particular are perceiving, even during COVID, and I know COVID maybe wasn't as threatening to them directly, but they are still perceiving the future threat of climate change and biodiversity collapse as infinitely greater for them. So we are living in this time, and this is what it means. We're living and witnessing something. And I, know, I don't know about you, but my poor mind can't keep up. I'm reading the newspaper every day, and there's more and more and more and more information. And I can't absorb and assimilate it quickly enough. So I struggle to know how to always think and feel about this. And sometimes it can be overwhelming. So then we can kind of just say, well, I just need a little bit of this information rather than all of this information. Humanity has never dealt with anything on this scale before. We've World wars and pandemics and the Cuban Missiles Crisis, they were globally threatening, but not at the scale of the climate crisis. So what I'm basically saying is it's perfectly reasonable to be feeling scared, anxious, angry, depressed, and that whole range of feelings makes perfect sense. So I'm using a psychological frame that includes the unconscious because we will defend against things that are unbearable or too threatening and we'll push them into our unconscious mind. Just watch Pixar inside out and you'll see the scale of the unconscious. So the climate psychology approach says, look, all of these feelings make perfect sense. We just don't wanna be feeling them all on the same day. It's okay to feel anger. It's okay to feel hope and hopelessness and grief and nostalgia and avoidance. And it's okay to feel despair because they all make perfect sense. To feel eco-anxiety is to feel emotionally healthy in response to the external reality. This is how we measure mental health. We look at our response to external reality and the external reality is pretty scary right now. So eco-anxiety is an emotionally healthy, rational response. I would really want people to feel proud that they have the capacity to care and that the empathy for what's going on in the world, rather than frame this as something to worry too much about. I'm not saying it's not uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. And it is specifically impacting in a huge extent for children and young people. Moving forwards, I think we've given enough of a kind of introduction to that. So um, I want to get to the results of the data. And before I do that, here's just a handy hint about ways we can approach this. So what climate psychology is saying is, yes, we need external activism. But listen, we also need internal activism. We need to take care of how we feel. We need to take care of our relationships. We need to take care of our thinking as well as external activism. And I borrowed this equation from Paddy, the Professional Association of Diving Instructors, who if you're in trouble underwater, say stop, think, breathe, then act. And I kind of tweaked it. It's not perfect. But when I think when we're approaching the climate crisis, we need to feel and think and remember to breathe. It helps self-regulate. Then we can understand. Then we can act. Then we transform this anxiety into empathy, compassion, courage, community, awareness, belonging, meaning, care, and aliveness. This is not something that we should judge as a bad thing. It's healthy. So let's move to the research findings because we surveyed 10,000 children and young people aged 16 to 25 across 10 different countries. A lot of the research questions were based on the qualitative research I've been doing for 10 years across the globe with children and young people. But I'd only spoken to three, 400 children, young people. And I knew that those numbers would not have the same impact as 10,000 young people. And we asked the questions in a range of countries. So, and it's not perfect. I'm the first to admit, this is not perfect. This is not representative of the whole world. But we're hoping that this gives enough information to make us start to think about this more carefully across the globe. We asked these countries the same 
questions in the Philippines, Nigeria, India, Portugal, countries that are facing the immediate impact of climate change today, and Brazil. And then others like the UK, the US, France, where it's a little bit more distant. Although after the summer, we've just had not so distant. And what we found is that eight out of 10 children and young people worry about climate change and that it's threatening people and the planet. But significantly, we knew they were worried. What we didn't know until this research came back was that 45%, nearly half, said that this was having a negative impact on their daily functioning, eating, concentrating, going to work, going to school, sleeping, spending time in nature, playing, having fun, relationships. One of the things we often hear is one of the ways to deal with eco-anxiety is spend time in nature. Well, yes, it can be really helpful. However, if your eco-anxiety is severe, spending time in nature can actually have the opposite effect. All you might see is the grief as you lose the natural world around you that you love. So it has to be approached in a very nuanced way. These are the results across the countries and we can see, it's not surprising, the impact on daily functioning, daily life, much greater in the Philippines, India, Nigeria, Brazil, much greater. But when we come to look at feelings, what we find is that the feelings of children in the UK are very similar to the feelings of the children across the rest of the world. Now, these are the global figures I'm giving you. Uh, we are going to be re releasing more information and more papers on the nuance and the detail of country by country comparison. But first of all, we wanted to release worldwide data. And we're seeing 67% of children and young people feeling sad, afraid, 62% feeling anxious. And then we've got angry, powerless, helpless, guilty. And you can see it goes down. You can see the optimistic is 31%, indifferent 29%. Indifferent means sometimes when we're overwhelmed by thoughts and feelings, we can just shut down. This is the UK, and you can see that the UK statistics are very similar to the rest of the world. No massive difference there. Over half of children that we polled said 55% thought that they would not have access to the same opportunities that their parents had. This is significant. So this is the way young people feel about their future. And don't forget, this is age 16 to 24. So some of these are young people who are already living a version of their adult lives. Over half, 52%, thought their family security would be threatened. This is economic, social, and physical security. Over half thought the things they most valued would be destroyed. Eight out of 10 thought that people had failed to take care of the planet. Three quarters thought the future was frightening. And you can see 75% worldwide, 73% UK. So not much difference there. Four out of 10 told us they were hesitant to have children because of climate change. You can see the UK data, same as the rest of the world. Over half, and this is the most devastating for me, 56% worldwide, 51% UK, think that humanity is doomed. So pretty awful. What makes this worse is nearly half, 48% of children and people said they'd felt dismissed or ignored by other people when they tried to talk about climate change worldwide and in the UK. Now that's something we can do something about. We can have these conversations intergenerationally. That we can do something about starting now, right? And then we asked about relationship with government and beliefs about government action. And what we found was that children and young people felt that governments were betraying themselves and future generations. Governments were dismissing their distress. Governments were lying about the impact of the action they were taking. And 65% told us that governments were failing young people. Very few felt that the government was protecting the planet. So these are, Horrifying statistics. For me, 
what's important, what would be utterly horrifying was if we didn't pay attention and didn't validate that this is how significant numbers of young people and children are feeling. I don't want us to get too depressed about this data. I want us to take action and I want us to validate it, young people and how they're feeling. I've been getting emails from young people all over the world as a result of this saying, thank you, this is how I feel. I thought I was alone. Now I don't feel alone. For me, that's what we need to be doing with it. Dealing with that abandonment, dealing with that sense of betrayal that young people are telling us they feel. Because there is hope. They can feel reassured and protected and valued and hopeful if we listen to them and if we respond with respect and don't dismiss their feelings or minimize them. I really have to say, this was not just me. This was an amazing group of researchers from six different universities, Panu Piccola from Finland, Liz Marx in the UK, Susan Clayton from the US, she's in France at the moment, Eric Lewandowski, Eloise Mayle, Britt Ray, Katrina Meller, and Lise Van Susteren. So this is a range of people, psychiatrists, psychologists, environmental psychologists, uh, an ecologist, youth activists, psychotherapists. We wanted to cover the range of, well, I'm sure it's not complete, but we wanted to be looking at this from all these perspectives and we have to thank them. And we were mentioned by the, uh, the United Nations, uh, um, Antonio Guterres, I can barely say it, I'm so overexcited still. Uh, he referenced our research in his opening speech to the UN last week talking about climate anxiety in children and young people. So mm. really, it doesn't get better than that for me. So thank you. I'm going to stop talking now. I'm sorry if I went over a bit. You didn't at all, Caroline. You didn't at all. You nailed it in terms of time. So well done. That, I mean, I'm kind of flummoxed by some of that research. It's very stark, the findings and the fact that for so many of those um, yeah. factors, there's over half of young people responding yeah it really but I guess we can't really tackle the problem until we know the extent of it and as you say to be able to take action and validate that is a cause for hope if we're all pulling in the in the one direction but I think it's it can be very difficult for people to get a sense of where we occupy that sort of middle space uh -huh. where we can feel the feelings but that they sort of motivate us to act rather than paralyze us in a sense of overwhelm and fear and I do I absolutely agree with you and I'm so glad you're saying that because you're absolutely right and in trying to do this fast I've probably missed out some of that slightly more reassuring stuff so I'm glad you're <laughs> asking that. Um, I am sorry yes. Okay um, we've still time to reassure everybody don't worry. I promise I, I start a lot of public talks by describing myself as the 13th fairy out of Sleeping Beauty who kind of swoops in and says you know this is awful and you're all gonna die um, but you know don't forget right there is a happy ending to that fairy story so what we need to remember is what we're talking about here there is hope and I actually have hope you might be surprised I've listened to these stories from children and young people for 10 years um, but actually what sustains me is their courage, their capacity to tell us how they feel, and radical hope, not naive hope. So humanity often splits into either or thinking, the doom and gloom, nihilistic, apocalyptic thinking, we're all going to die down one end of the spectrum. And at the other end of the spectrum, we've got the kind of naive optimism and the kind of, oh, technology will save us. The government will save us. Oh, we'll be all right. Well, humans have dealt with worse than this. You know the stuff, right? The thing is, is that is no longer reassurance. That is greenwashing, or I'm going to try really hard not to swear, but that is lying. Um, I'm going to tell you what Sophia, an eight-year-old, told me years ago. So when I first started this research, I talked to young children and said, how do we talk about this without traumatizing you? And I'm going to tell you what she said because she says it beautifully. She says, well, you've got to tell me the truth because if you don't tell me the truth, you're lying to me. And if you lie to me, I can't trust you. And if I can't trust you, I can't tell you how I feel. And if I can't tell you how I feel, I'm on my own and I feel lonely and that feels worse. She said, but don't tell me all the bad news all at once. Tell me some good news and tell me some bad news. Tell me some good news and tell me some bad news. She said, and anyway, I love this child. I wish she was running the world. She said, anyway, she said, I'm not a baby, right? 
she was eight. Oh. So oh. the way I talk about this is the sheep of doom and the shark of hope. <laughs> What we've got to do, you didn't know you were getting a sheep and a, sheep and a shark. I didn't. I'm uh, delighted. They're, they're everywhere with me, these guys, right? So we have to navigate the tension between these opposites and in between the naive hope and the, the apocalyptic thinking is radical hope. And radical hope, we find courage, compassion, altruism, care for ourselves and for others. And that means we can stand in the middle of that tension and not collapse emotionally mm -hmm. into either of those opposites. We don't go into either or thinking, we stay in the both and thinking. It is bad and there is so much we can do. It is too late now to change the beginning of this story. It's too late to change the climate change. It, it's too late for the Maldives. It's too late to stop the beginning of this story. Even if we went to zero carbon emissions tomorrow, it would be too late. Sea levels will continue to rise. So humanity needs to kind of grow up and mature or grow down into these feelings and develop the emotional resilience to deal with this. That is the transformational possibility that I mentioned at the beginning. And that's radical hope. It's awful. And there is so much we can do. And partly what we need to do is be doing it together. So find community, have these conversations, support each other, validate feelings. Don't dismiss people's feelings just because you don't understand them. It doesn't mean they're not important. Mm -hmm. So that's sure. the radical hope position in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you for bringing your friends with you, the shark and the sheep. I, bet, I wasn't aware that they were available this morning. This is great. <laughs> we'll come back to talk a little bit more about this later in the webinar. But now I just want to move on to our next guest, Tyg McIntyre. Now, Tyg is Assistant Professor of Environmental Psychology at Maynooth University. And Tyg is going to help us really understand why we seem to find it hard cognitively to get a handle on this climate crisis. Hi, how's it going? Um, Hi, Tyke. That was a really interesting uh, conversation, and uh, I don't have the puppets to uh, add to my story, but um, hopefully I'll be able to share some insights. And I, I think this is a really interesting start point because I'm, I, I'm guess I'm bringing a different uh, perspective, even though we're both um, environmental psychologists. Um, and I, I, I think one of the pieces that I'll try to bring is just context in relation to other problems and how we've coped and, and uh, dealt with those in, in recent years. And hopefully that'll be uh, instructive. Um, so I'm an env environmental psychologist at Maynooth University. And, you know, rather than explain what an environmental psychologist is, I'll just give you a hint. They put me in the basement, right? So, you know, I think they realize is I don't actually have to have the best room in the house because, you know, I'm studying nature and, you know, nature in the city in particular so much that I get out quite a bit. So um, I, I do thank them for that. Um, I'm interested in how nature itself can actually be the solution to um, some of these issues because there's co there's co-occurring issues here essentially it's like you know we're at a confluence where there's rivers with different bringing us different problems and some of them are moving more fast than others i think we saw that in the last talk so we have a biodiversity crisis we have um you know some people would say there's an obesity um uh pandemic and i wouldn't use use that term uh other people might say there's a sedentary behavior crisis of people being inactive uh there's Eco anxiety, there is, you know, and 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 climate change, and the, so we have this, you know, almost family of problems. And the way uh, our research team on our European project, Go Green Roots, are trying to address this is by looking at, at them together and not in isolation. And I'm not suggesting that you know other people are are looking at this narrowly. We're just, you know, having to connect them to try find some solutions. So we're looking at a natural way to foster urban health and well-being, which can deal with some of these issues around uh, eco anxiety and um, reducing stress in the city as well in, in different ways. Um, I'll just give you a quick um, quote. This is obviously a Nobel laureate whom we all know, Mary Robinson, um, and she suggests climate change is the moonshot of this generation. Now, I highlight that quote not because to get to the moon is 
uh, that challenging um, because we're actually now looking at getting people on Mars. So I think we we should bring a, an optimism to some of the greatest challenges we've uh, had to deal with uh, in, in recent years. And I think that probably is a start point. So we should acknowledge eco-anxiety in context of other issues. Now, I, um, as a result of my mentor in UCD, the late Professor Aidan Morn, I've always realized that to step forward, one should always have uh, an eye over your shoulder. And it wasn't out of paranoia or because I did, did rowing, I was actually a canoeist, but it was, it just, it meant you had an eye on history. And we have faced existential threats before um, on a grand scale. And these have led to overwhelming anxiety in studies of youth um, in, in 1986. Or, uh, there's some exemplar studies. They were actually prior to Chernobyl and they, they showed, you know, I, I guess the data wouldn't be dissimilar to what we, we've just, just been enlightened about uh, from the UK. And I think what that's instructive is there's a generational thing and it's really good that youth you know, are the reservoir of anxiety and courage and many other um, dimensions for society. Um, and I think that's one way to look at it. There's a developmental issue here. There's a trajectory they're on and there's an awareness. Um, and I, I think we should, should look at it in, in, that, in that light. Um, and I, I think that's where we look at something like 9-11, which was essentially a, a, an acute stressor, right? Without, you know, downgrading it, but it was an acute stressor compared to COVID or compared to the long-term uh, issue we have around uh, cl climate change. And I think with that, there were some interesting responses. So in New York City, there was actually an ongoing study um, by um, uh, George Bonanno, a psychologist, was conducting a study at the time on resilience in the city. And this word we haven't heard yet today, and I think it's important. So we actually heard you know, from the, that research is that a huge proportion of people suffered, you know, symptoms of acute stress. However, the majority of people in, in excess of 65 percent actually um, showed high degree of resilience. So over about 18 months, two years, they had bounced back, not to their start point, but actually were thriving as a result because they found new, you know, uh, new pathways in their lives. They'd reconsidered some of their, their um, work relationships, their work emphasis on work-life balance, et cetera. So there was a shift in their thinking for many people. Um, and there are some people, a very small proportion actually suffered long-term PTSD, and that is traumatic and, and challenging and requires extensive long-term treatment. So we, we shouldn't undersell that, but we think we have to have an awareness that at major events, major crises, we have come together and shown Resilience. Now, we're con we've conducted research on resilience in the Irish context during times of COVID, and there are actually um, large scale samples with athletes across, you know, Gaelic games, um, rugby, and uh, Olympic sports. And similarly, during times of uh, crisis for them, when many of them were denied participation, competition, the Olympic Games being postponed, and you know, I won't, you know, undersell that because that's a really important thing. So that's a major. These are major challenges for these athletes on their uh, trajectory, and it's just one, you know, microcosm of our society. Uh, the majority, overwhelming majority of those, displayed high levels of resilience. In other words, they were able to cope with the stressor by being agile, by moving their goals, by accessing their emotional resources. And we know, you know, COVID has given us a window into talking about mental health um, challenges and and problems um, more more easily. And this comes to my next issue is, are we talking about catastrophe, crisis or challenge? So I'll just give an example. So we did an intervention, a nature-based intervention with Mental Health Ireland and other stakeholders during, um, during one of the lockdowns. And the intervention was based around um, promoting people to go out into green space. And it was a program called Nature Moves. And when we were in a meeting about that, we had a discussion, and this is just dealing with COVID-19 COVID lockdowns and that scenario and not the bigger threat uh, to humanity, which around uh, climate. And one of the staff very acutely pointed out that we'd written down the word crisis and we'd said we should be using the word challenge. And the reason that language is important 
is because we actually don't have a really good capacity to adapt super rapidly uh, and change our behavior in the long term based on you know ne ne what we call negative emotions. So negative emotions overwhelm us, and then we basically get this feeling of status. And just give you one, one example, like one of the symptoms of depression that you may know or you may have noticed is is essentially the, the, the old word would be motor retardation. So essentially a slowness in movement. And that's almost what happens with when we're overwhelmed by something. You know, we, we're parked, we can't even move. And that's almost the mindset that can come from the, the, what I would call the debilitating language around catastrophe and crisis. It tends not to mobilize us. So one of the things we could look towards when we're having conversations about eco-anxiety is to actually use a language which is motivating, which uh, draws people in and which empowers them. And we're trying to avoid one of these issues, what we call learned helplessness. We're actually trying to get learned optimism. So should we applying an optimism language, an optimistic you know, vernacular if you want to get there? One of the things we have strong levels of evidence on, and we're just finishing a review on this, um, but I'll, I'll is a shift to green space during lockdowns. I'll give you one example. So Quilcha have released data and Sport Ireland to show you know, large numbers of people go into green space. When possible, the numbers um, going to Quilcha forests tripled. Now, what's interesting about that is they're now staying at the high numbers. So technically, people have displaced some of their sport and gym-based physical activity with going to green space. And they weren't just going there for exercise. Many of them have reported in different studies of going there for solace and psychological recovery, or to, you might call it decompression from, from the, the, the lockdown scenarios. And what's interesting about that is we may have a kind of self-writing mechanism to deal with these kind of, you know, at least a, a medium to long-term stressors. So we should be a little bit more optimistic about you know, how we can um, deal with, with, with eco-anxiety in that we have a capacity to be resilient. We have this capacity, you know, to shape the language we use, which allows us to bring people with us and not to be uh, ex excluding people by creating, you know, um, I, I guess, barriers through, through the, the phraseology we apply. One of the interesting things, and this is a quote from Una May, um, who's director of sport participation in Sport Ireland said um, that it took, uh, you know, a lockdown to get Irish people moving. And it's an ironic quote that people sat on the couch until they were, you know, basically restricted from cycling more than 2K from their house or walking more than 2K from the house or going to the gym. Once they were told they couldn't exercise, they all went out and did it in green space. And, you know, that, that's interesting because what happened was people were told lots of things they couldn't do. Um, they were denied autonomy around a lot of actions about going to work, going to so socialize anywhere, but they weren't denied autonomy around seeking nature for well-being. And this is why we, in our current project, are focusing on how nature can bring people together and give them uh, a capacity uh, to, to define their own pathway for coping because there are many different possibilities on that. I'm just gonna take you, take you forward into, um, into the next step. If words we use and nature matter, what do we do next? So that probably gives you an insight into where I'm going. So the UN have goals for 2030, the UN SDGs, there are 17 of them. And we would you know, propose that these are highly interlinked. So we've got good health and well-being, and that is linked to all of these. And that's where climate action comes in. So they're using the word climate action notably yeah. as well. And I think this is an interesting narrative here is to know that, you know, if we're looking at mental health and health as being linked to all these different facets, we should, you know, realize and recognize that mental health issues are linked to inequality and lack of opportunity. And we know that green space availability that has led to, uh, in areas where they had lack of green space, there were not only higher levels of COVID, but also commensurate um, mental health issues because of lack of service. And also they, they were denied a capacity to look after their own mental health and well-being. And we know more generally the health burden of COVID-19 substantially uh, is greater for diverse communities and women at work. 
So I would boldly say that human environmental health are not entirely unrelated. And that's probably the star point of our current work. So we're one year into our project. What we do is, you know, we apply nature in the way Seamus Heaney might. You know, it's where perhaps where hope and history rhyme. Nature really does give us this, you know, a connection to biodiversity because you see it, you feel it. You can, you can, you know, a connection to air quality. You'll understand, but about pollution in the city when you see the absence of lichen on trees. So lichen is a bio indicator. It tells us if if there's uh, good or poor air quality in an area. And this is the complexity around what we do. I'm just going to give you a fast track instead and just tell you we're working across six European cities and some others, but target on six European cities, and one of them is is Limerick in Ireland. And Limerick is a city with huge ambition. So their you know, population transformation uh, over the next um, 20 years under uh, Ireland 2040 is very, very ambitious and will perhaps increase by you know, um, almost 100%. Um, we are a four year project. We work with lots of stakeholders and we just demonstrate what can be done with nature. That's our role. Um, one of the interesting things, we have a lot of PhDs and a lot of them are, are in psychology and environmental psychology. And, you know, as a result of COVID, we've actually had to change some of the questions we're asking in our, in our study. We're now much more focused on understanding, you know, what are the learnings from COVID scenarios that can help us deal with big, big challenges with climate change and with eco-anxiety. So some of the solutions we're applying are to prioritize human and environmental health in a connected way. We're looking at promoting green exercise and active travel in cities, because we know right now that actually public transport might be back at full capacity, but people aren't prioritizing it. People have got used to short journeys by walking to the shop for active travel or green exercise or being physically active in, in green space. And that is a better return on investment than going to the gym. It's a lower carbon footprint. And this is what we call sustainable physical activity. One key thing we noticed during lockdown was that, you know, people often sought solace in parks and parks didn't always offer them this quiet, what we call a restorative space. So we're working with cities, including Lati, which is the European green capital this year, to create therapy gardens and restorative green spaces. And that means there'll be a quiet place in the city for people to seek solace and for also to promote social interaction. In other words, if we're going to say that nature and you know areas of high biodiversity and maybe with tree canopy cover are really good for people, then we should ensure that they exist and they're within, according to WHO guidelines, about 800 meters of your home. We're applying citizen-led activities to build back, back better. So we have citizen science, we have co-creation of different initiatives. So it can't be the scientists telling people what to do in our view. But we actually have an interesting innovation and it's called a city scorecard for mental health. So cities actually now compete to get foreign direct investment companies in and uh, for, for different centers, for example. However, um, one of the things that they're increasingly gonna compete on is mental health and wellbeing. So our idea of a scorecard is work with the cities and help them develop um, an index which shows how good they are at preventative approaches to mental health, at offering treatment, at having uh, areas for recovery and s reducing mental health stigma. And we think this, you know, in light of the conversation today is, is a key initiative. Essentially, we're looking to solve a range of problems together. Some people might call these wicked problems. We might be a little bit more optimistic than that. Um, so just to highlight, we have a, a training event coming up in the uh, coming weeks in Maynooth, and I'll put something in the chat about that. Thank you. Thanks, Tyg. That was great and really interesting. So thank you so much for joining us this morning to share, share your research on that ongoing project with us, as well as it's interesting to talk about language and how important it is. And, you know, I love the idea of learned optimism. You know, we can, we definitely have the capacity to learn intrinsic. But I was wondering um, if you've thoughts about so the idea of connecting more with nature, returning to nature, you know, green exercise, all of that sort of stuff. What can we do to ensure that it doesn't become, I saw a question come in from one of our guests as well on this, that it doesn't become like a consumption model, that nature becomes another thing that exists for us to consume and make us feel better, but that it doesn't get the flip back on the symbiotic relationship. Yeah, 
Um, look, I think it's a good question and it's one that should be asked. You know, if you bring people to nature, um, you're also limiting the capacity of that nature to thrive. I mean, you almost have to do a cost benefit analysis here on this, which is obviously getting very technical, but I, I put it another way. I think, you know, if people are to have, you know, be architects of their own future, if they are of their, you know, their future um, places for recovery and solace, well, then you want them connected to it. Because one of the things we know statistically and scientifically from nature connection is that increased nature connection is linked to well-being, but increased nature connection is also increased, uh, leads to increased nature conservation or pro-environmental behaviors. So it's not just going there to make you feel good, it's going there because that increased affinity you have for natural systems will change your behavior. And that's, you know, something we're also testing in our project. But, it, you know, people's awareness around biodiversity, around, you know, uh, the the, the health of the nature in their cities and their own health is it, very uh, obvious to them when they're in these spaces. And, you know, when you can highlight whether it's, you know, you know, the, the increased tree canopy cover that protects them from air pollution, from the and noise pollution, the co-hazards we have in cities. So I think, it, you know, there, there is a, a risk benefit reward here. The benefit is huge because people many people will become guardians and stewards of their own natural environment. I guess it activates that sort of radical aspect of what Caroline was talking about. Yeah, and in fact, it, it, you know, it, technically we'd say it's linked to empathy. So mm. you know, empathy we use to talk about the, you know, um, the, the interaction between human beings, but actually you, know, you can have empathy for your environment too. Um, and that's essentially what you can increase and enhance through getting people not just active in nature, but getting them engaged and activated by nature. I'm conscious of the time. And actually, just as you've teed it up, we're now going to have a chat with Anthony Freeman, who's very much living out that idea of something that is conserving biodiversity and educating a community in uh, Dublin 8. So Anthony is the beekeeper at the Inner City Beekeeping Project. Hi, Anthony, how are you doing? Hey, don't worry. <laughs> Good, thanks. Um, Anthony, I just we could talk to you for about two hours on this just by yourself because it's so interesting. But can you just begin by telling us what is the Inner City Beekeeping Project and how did you get involved with it? It's actually, it was actually brilliant listening to the two previous talkers because our work is really similar and it's really exciting. Um, the beekeeping, like uh, Tweg was saying, you need to give people a sort of a reason to want to be in nature. And I think beekeeping, bees in general are just like a, uh, that you can lure people in to that. Once they start working with the bees, then they want to know everything else. And I think that because that's what happened with me. I had no real, real love or passion for bees or biodiversity. And then someone asked me to look after bees and I trained in Robert Emmett, CDP, to look after the bees. And ever since then, it's just I'm all about nature and bees and stuff like that. I mean, you're kind of a bee evangelist at this point, Anthony. Oh, yeah, like you're yeah, mad about the bees. Like Toy was saying there about green spaces, we've 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 sort of started that ourselves. We've been creating green spaces in the city. Our goal, Robert Emmett, the goal is we want to train people from other community centres to 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 be a beekeepers themselves, and then we'll help them create a space where they keep the hives. And it's it's easier for people from from and especially in a city community, someone from the own their own community to teach them about these things. Mm -hmm. They respond them a lot better. So. That's the hope. It's it's all really exciting. There's a lot of there's a lot of good work we can do, and mm -hmm. I think the bees are like uh, the gateway drug into all that. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I think for some people, you know, as we touched on with the other speakers, the idea of climate change can feel like such a massive problem and because of those of us who are sort of geographically privileged to not live at the front line of wildfires and all of these things in Ireland. Yes. You know, it can be maybe a bit hard to fully process the extent of it, but, you know, you're not sort of hammering the message of climate change. You're more encouraging people to come along and connect with nature and get involved. Yeah. And you do like tours with the community of the beehives. Yeah, I think I think we're past the point of uh, the warnings now. I think it's all a, it's solutions and there's a lot of great. Like, it's exciting for me. It's exciting because I think with nature and all it's you can it's going to be a great way of building community. And we've already started. Well, like we have a lot of people interested. And it's all mixed backgrounds and stuff, so it's really exciting. And it's there's a lot we can there's a lot we can achieve. 
and it's for mental health. I know me from my own experience having a breakdown and stuff like that. I grew up in Oliver Bond and I've been drowning in the concrete of the city my whole life. So working with the bees was probably my first true experience of nature. Like I've been to parks and had the con- day-, day trips to the countryside, but working with the bees is my first true like I-, I was part of nature, you know, mm. that sort of way. And if there's anybody listening to us today, Anthony, who thinks, you know, well, bees are grand for honey, but like, do they not sting you all the time? I'm not really mad about bees. Tell us how awesome bees are. They're, they're just so fascinating. The, when you walk a bees, you can you, you can understand how easy it is to achieve something if you're all together. Like a, a, a colony, people think a colony is a queen controlling a whole colony. It's not like that at all. It's a, it's a massive democracy. Like, the bees, the all... The queen will lay 2,000 eggs a day, but the rest of them, the workers are working hard and they're making all the decisions. They, they, they make decisions. My favourite thing about bees is a swarm. And when a swarm, when a swarm leaves a hive and they're going to find a new hive, um, it's just amazing what they do. The, the oldest bees, the, the most uh, intelligent bees, they'll go and search for the new homes. And when they come back, they'll have a dance off. Like each bee will have a dance, a dance from where from where they're at the coming, and they'll have a dance off, and then how they'll decide who have has the best dance off. The other bees will repeat that dance, and that's how they'll decide where their new home is. So they're really they're just amazing. That's just, proper like proper yeah. influencing. That's my kind of influencing. I love it. Um, in terms of like, I know part of the kind of guiding principles of the Robert Emmett community pro- community development project are about creating these sustainable uh, projects in the community. And certainly with the beekeeping, like you're producing honey to sell as well. Like it's yeah, a full yeah. circle initiative, isn't it? Yeah, well, hopefully we have, we're going to hire at least three people for next summer. So we're excited about what that, and that's how the honey is, that is going to fund that. But, um, but there's, there's just loads we can do. Like the we, the mindful space we created is just like Kai was talking about a green space that you sort of forget you're in the city and especially mm. with the bees at the in the green spaces. Um, you probably won't want bees in every green space you have, but it's just easy to it's just easy to get people to listen when you have when you have yeah. a, a decent hook for them to get into. You know, and no more than you just described with yourself, it creates that connection for them and begins that journey of exactly this yeah. is you know it's a cycle between ourselves and our environment. Exactly, I had absolutely no interest in in any of that stuff before I started look, looking after the bees, and now I'm creating green spaces all over the city, and I'm really passionate about. I just want to do everything to help the bees, but other than that, I'm learning more and more every day about biodiversity myself and. Mm. It's, it's, it's exciting when you start learning about things and you, you mm. start seeing the solutions and how how um how how easy it is for people to, to change people's mentality when they see the benefits for themselves like it's really yeah it's, there's a lot of exciting things going on i mean i have to say you've given me a massive injection of hope around this whole thing to see how passionate you are about it and how the how the initiative has taken off. It would make you really feel inspired and positive that these sort of initiatives, when they pop up, they really do harness people's um, interest and willingness to engage. But just for people who maybe aren't familiar with the inner city beekeeping project, like you've got hives in Christchurch Cathedral Garden, you've got them over at Guinness, like you've got them all over landmarks in the city, these beehives that you're yeah. managing. There's more coming, the Lord Mayor wants some, there's more coming. So. Yeah, it's great, and it's great because it's uh, uh, it's it's people that you wouldn't expect to be doing beekeeping, like people from inner city flats and stuff like that, and they're mixing with people you probably normally wouldn't mix with, and it's building community and connections and stuff like that. So it's 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 a it's a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful. Yeah, thing. It is a wonderful thing for sure. And if people want to know more about it, we'll put the links when this uh, discussion is available afterwards to view online we'll put the links to Robert Emmett Community Development Project and to the Inner City Beekeeping Project there so that yeah. people can go and maybe visit you and learn more about it. Yeah we, we, we always want people I mean we, we, we want people to understand the mindfulness of the, of the beekeeping as well because it's a really powerful source of mindfulness because mm. with mindfulness you just have to be like yeah you don't you're thinking of nothing else the world has gone away and when you're when you're in a hive there's nothing else you, you feel like you're part of that hive and there's nothing else going on around you. Uh-huh. It's the noise and you just have to focus on what you're doing and nothing else matters. Oh, it sounds fantastic, Anthony. It sounds fantastic. I mean, the bees are going to be hibernating now in a couple of weeks. Like you're kind of wrapping it up for the Active summer now. They're not like bears. They don't go to sleep. But no. <laughs> they'll, uh, they'll actively hibernate. They'll make a little ball around the queen 
and they'll vibrate our bodies. The bodies to keep inside there at a certain temperature. And, oh my God, amazing. Yeah. I just would like to bring back in Ty and Caroline at this stage, if you stay with me too, Anthony, and we just maybe go through a few questions that some of our uh, attendees have, have shared with us. So if um, we go to the hello, you're all back there, that's great. So uh, one of the questions that has come up, Caroline, so Kevin O'Sullivan was wondering, obviously your research and your area of interest has shown that eco-anxiety is quite dominant among young people, but you know, to what extent do you have a handle on to what extent it's felt by older people? Mm. Well, absolutely. Um, we feel exactly the same, don't we? Um, I think every researcher involved in this project was very honest about the fact that we felt we resonated with the responses that we were getting from children and young people. I think the big difference is as older people, adults, um, we've developed adult defences against despair and distress and painful truths. And we can use those adult defences. We've had more experiences in life um, of building our resilience. I'm generalising horribly, so I apologise. But we've had more experience of these things, which means that we've built, hopefully, some resilience. And I think those defences can serve as well, but they can also get in the way of us empathising and understanding it from the perspective of children and young people. So I think it's really important that we don't kind of say that one is the right way to feel this. Um, I, my psychotherapy practice has as many adults uh, coming for therapeutic support as children and young people, there's no question. And in fact, increasingly, I'm seeing more men coming for support psych in psychotherapy than women. Traditionally, more women might look for therapeutic support with social and family and personal problems, but a lot of men are coming for support with this. So I really would say there is not massive difference in the way people think and feel, but the difference is in terms of the way in which you kind of project into the future. And for older people, we've lived a significant part of our lives. Mm. And so we're actually having to deal with the grief and we're having to deal with a disillusionment that we maybe grew up thinking it would all be all right. So we've got a disillusionment process to go through before mm. we can build the resilience. For children and young people, they've often grown up with this as their norm. Um, so because yeah. that's fairly normal for them, they're processing it slightly differently to adults, to older people. And I know these are awful generalizations, but the numbers that we're hearing say this means I, I'm gonna take a risk at that generalization. But uh, I don't think there's that much significant difference um, at all, except perhaps, perhaps on average, older people are more willing to um, believe the greenwashing. And I think children and young people tend to see through it because mm. they're feeling rather let down. Mm. I'm wondering, one of the questions that came up in a few different guises from different uh, attendees this morning is around support for people who might present with eco-anxiety, be that with their GP or through sort of mental health services and advocacy groups, like how, what could or should they be doing around the idea of eco-anxiety and trying to empower people and alleviate that worry a bit? That's just a general question to anybody who <laughs> wants to answer. Do you want to go first? Um, I'm okay on, on that, but largely because I'm I'm a practitioner, but I've worked in, in sports psychology and, you know, it, I don't see that client group, but I think okay. re recognition of the problem is, is is really important here. And as, as Caroline stated, acknowledgement that for some people, this is an overwhelming burden. I can, I, can, I can come in and add to that. Thank you. Um, in the Climate Psychology Alliance, we're developing a practice of climate aware therapeutic approaches. And um, we're running a lot of training programs for teachers, psychologists, GPs, psychiatrists, nurses, all mental health practitioners, trying to develop this climate aware therapeutic understanding. So it really means using a sort of climate lens in the same way if you think about using a trauma lens to help mm -hmm. us understand people's experience of the world through a trauma lens if someone's experienced trauma then you can understand what's happening to them through applying this lens 
it makes perfect sense. So I'm constructing the same idea with a climate crisis lens, that if you can understand people's response through this climate crisis awareness, then actually their anxiety, their depression, their despair makes perfect sense. So it's a way of helping people not just manage their feelings, I don't like managing feelings, but a way of navigating feelings and welcoming the range of feelings, but also cognitively process this and being able to think about it. So we're running workshops in the Climate Psychology Alliance, and we will also support people in setting up climate cafes. So I don't think you have to over-professionalize this, you know? You don't need a psychotherapist if you're eco-anxious. You might do, but we're not the only people who can help. And Rebecca Nestor and the CPA is coming out to schools, to organizations, to government departments, to, we're working with MIND, trying to develop a, a mental health awareness program for people, for counselors, as well as for people using the services. Uh, and these climate cafes are brilliant. This, you bring a group of people together to talk about how they feel. Tea and cake mm -hmm. helps. Um, we run a few in the evenings over uh, a beer or a glass of wine. And it's really about people feeling that they're not alone. Uh, I've been running parent support groups for the last few years where parents are supporting each other and how to talk with each other about their children. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to sort of over professionalize and make this sound like, you know, you have to see somebody who's, you know, qualified to deal with this because it really is the, the human understanding of empathy and compassion and understanding mm -hmm. which also both, both your other speakers we were all talking about the same thing but from really interesting perspectives um so we're all talking about kind of humanity's need to understand each other aren't mm -hmm. we um so that's what, what i try and say there yeah no yeah, thanks just, for just on that that's a i think i'm really intrigued by Anthony's passion. You know, Anthony, you just showed such, you know, vitality and um, passion in your interest for nature as a result of your, your work with bees. And that's, you know, central to the approach we're taking is if we connect people with, with nature, we allow that, you know, it springs like a fish from water. Nobody had to tell you what to do. It just, once you got into that space, it happened. So I think one of the solutions is actually to ensure that people can access nature. They can access areas of high biodiversity. They can, you know, we have more schemes which are citizen-led and citizen-driven like Anthony's. So that, you know, our perception of nature being, uh, you know, a, a them and us point, it, it can, that if, we break, if we break down that barrier, if we can foresee that we're actually part of like what's called the planetary kind of health view is that we're, we're just another functioning being on, on the planet. And then there are many other organisms we have to, you know, um, thrive with. And I, I think this, you know, uh, just to, to, on a more serious point, I think I need to taste some of the honey from there as well. So, <laughs> yeah. I think Anthony, yeah, we're going to have to maybe send out some honey to everybody so they can test the, the product. <laughs> Yeah, everybody's chasing the honey. Yeah, everybody wants me honey. Yeah. Uh, we're almost finished for, for now, but I just wanted to ask quickly, did any of you want to ask each other anything? Was there any questions that occurred to you when the different speakers were speaking that you wanted to ask the other guests on this morning's webinar? Well, we'd need hours. I know, I know. You've got about you've got about thirty seconds. I would love, I would love to talk about this for hours. Now, I was really interested to hear you referencing the nine eleven research because I've also made use of that myself in uh, in my teaching at the university. Um, I, I have nothing to ask other than really I would say thank you because it's been a pleasure to hear the really different understandings that have been expressed here. And we've got more in common than we have difference between us. And that reflects actually what children and young people have been saying to me from all over the world. And that's what strikes me is the children and young people in Nigeria and the UK, the US have more in common with each other and with us than difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to be at the heart of what we're trying to do here in this mm -hmm. healing. It's a process of healing perhaps for humanity. Sure. Yeah, there, there is... Um... There is this point that you know having a common um, a, a common enemy is is uh, or common challenge is really bonding, and I think you know Alex Ferguson used to do, use that in the dressing room, and I think as society we can use that to bring people together. Mm.
Mm. Anthony, have you anything you want to add? No, I was just, I was just fascinated listening to the two of us, and it was really interesting to hear what you have that is similar to the work we're actually doing. So it's really fascinating. I'd love to hear from them again. I'd love to get their emails, yeah. to pick their brains. Like, but it was Absolutely. really, it well, really was fascinating listening to you. And explain that known just people like you was out there and full of solutions more than problems. So, well, I that's think. What no. I think we all feel like that about you, <laughs> the sense of uh, the practical uh, work that you're doing. Uh, absolutely. But can I can I just give a shout out finally to sure. the young people and the children who are taking legal action to push governments into taking their views seriously? We have six young people and children in Portugal at the moment taking 33 European governments to court because of failure to act on climate change. So I think everything we've heard here is absolutely fascinating and relevant, but there's also just another angle there for children and young people where they're needing to step into that legal realm. And I think that's what we absolutely have to support them in and listen mm. to what they're saying. They're speaking about another level of hurt and another level of moral injury there because their conscience is alive. And I, I trust that all of our conscience are alive because we're here, right? So, mm -hmm. but there's something being hurt in children there that I don't think we've fully wrapped our heads around yet. And I think we need to be really mindful of that. And if mm -hmm. we talk together with each other about that and maybe get the wisdom of the bees on board because I think the bees might have some you. answers. The bees we definitely are aware of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, listen to them. Say that again, Anthony. There's a real selflessness to bees. Like a, a, a bee can go foraging knowing that they'll never use that field. It's for the herb and it's not for them. They'll probably never live to experience that field. So there's a real selflessness to that. Yeah, I mean, personally, I just feel like I really need to come down to you and get involved with the bees because from the mindfulness to the understanding of democracies and selflessness and all the rest of it it sounds just yeah. well going back to your point caroline transformative so i think that's where we where we need to be channeling our radical hope um it's I now think we've got us, i think all three of us spoke about that transformation that's true so, that's true yeah thank you yeah um we've run over time i'm afraid so we have to wrap up but just to thank you all again for your time it was really interesting to if we were in a physical place i think you would feel the warmth coming in for you on the comments and the questions but it just falls to me to communicate it to you that people have found it really interesting and really engaging as have i and for anyone who'd like to share it with somebody else to watch afterwards it'll be available on demand at walkinmyshoes.ie thanks everybody take care and hopefully we'll talk again soon